Welcome everyone to Tech Canada's Deeper Insights webinar series. My name is Ruth Ann and as, as always, it is my pleasure to host and moderate these sessions. Just a couple of housekeeping uh, reminders for everyone is that uh, you please use the question box to type in any comments or questions that you might have to engage with our speaker at any time. We do have a few breaks built into the presentation this morning, so I'm hoping that you'll all be fired up and ready to go. The wonder of having Zoom or GoToMeeting is that we can bring in people like Chris Payton. Um, Chris is coming to us live from London, England. And uh, Chris, it's it's lovely that you're taking your evening to, to join us here in, in Canada. Chris is a former Lieutenant Colonel in the Royal Marines. He was also a strategic advisor for the Ministry of Defense and a leading war game practitioner. I am just so excited about this war gaming and I think that this is a wonderful and exciting way to kind of change up strategic planning. So without further ado, Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, Ruzan, and thank you for, for having me on and good morning, everyone uh, in Canada. Um, fantastic opportunity to be able to talk to you, which is, as Ruth Ann says, you know, ordinarily would only be possible through flights uh, and travel. So it's actually great to be able to engage with you. And please, I am a very interactive speaker uh, on this subject. I think the more questions that come in, the better, because then that either helps me understand that I haven't quite explained something as well as I could have done, uh, or areas that you want to explore in, in greater depth. So by all means, ask questions through the, through the uh, question box, as Ruth has said, right the way through the presentation, uh, and we'll take them as we go along rather than waiting right to the end. A little bit more about me um, and my background. As Ruth said, for 18 years, I served as an officer in the Royal Marines. I went to all the holiday hotspots, you would imagine, over that time in the world. So I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. Um, but I was also in the Balkans, in Kosovo, um, I was in uh, Georgia, and I served at a lot of other combat operation areas as well. So I think by the time I'd come to the end of my 18 years, uh, I had served a total of four and a half years in some sort of war zone or another. Uh, so quite a lot of experience of fast moving, fast changing, dynamic situations. Uh, but my last job, in the military was to be head of Afghan strategy to the then uh, Prime Minister David Cameron uh, and I was given the task as head of Afghan strategy having worked on what we were doing in Afghanistan to get everybody out and home. So the UK came out of Afghanistan around about the same sort of time frame as the Canadian forces did uh, and it became my job to work out how we were going to get all 12,000 people back and over 20,000 shipping containers worth of equipment out either through, Af through Pakistan and through the seaports or through Central Asia and out through Russia or on trains or being flown out. And as you can imagine, during that time, um, you were having lots of conversations. I was having lots of conversations with different governments um, in Washington, in Kabul, um, in Tallinn, in Estonia, uh, and all over. Uh, I was also dealing with lots of different government departments from the, the Foreign Office uh, to the Department for International Development, and everybody felt like they had a stake in what was going on as we were trying to design this extraction plan and get people out without over levels of risk, because you've got to take the equipment out at the same time as you're taking people out. We didn't have enough time to essentially take out all of the people and then backload all the equipment. And you still need people to get the equipment out. So balancing this risk of which equipment comes out and when and how many people are out by that point in time and who is now at an increasing level of personal risk was obviously quite a challenge. And it was the first time I'd really dealt with politics, with politicians, with civil servants. Until that point in time, I'd been a military person mostly uh, on the ground, as we would say, uh, with the muck and the bullets. And I came out of one particular political meeting in an, a, a low simmering rage uh, as the some of the people in the room had deliberately torpedoed a plan that had taken us a long time to put together because of their own personal political agendas. 
it so happened that I came across an article at that point in time in a business magazine, um, which I now know as the Harvard Business Review, but had not heard of at that point in time, that said about how some situations are so fluid, they're so dynamic, they're so fast moving and so wicked was the term that was used at the time, that you can't actually create any plan for them. And I was so irritated and in such a foul mood that I basically hammered away at my keyboard for about an hour uh, and sent back a response. And essentially it was just a response, like a comment almost back. Uh, but it was liked so much that we ended up myself and a couple of other collaborators being published in the Harvard Business Review ourselves for how you go about dealing with uncertainty. And a lot of it came down to this use of the gaming that we're going to be talking about now uh, and through this next period. And so the, the image you see up there now next to, next to the, uh, the HBR article is me in New York, um, having been flown out there business class to go and talk to the C-suite of the Fortune 500, which is a pretty cool thing to do when you're still in the military. It's even cooler when you're in this lie flat business class bed um, that somebody is paying for you to go out and do. And the only time you've ever been to America or Canada previously is in the back of a Hercules at minus 10 shivering with your knees touching the, the the person opposite you in some webbing seats so pretty quickly you start to think well actually there's probably something to this business game and people seem to be interested in what i'm saying so nine years ago now i set up the business quirk solutions and we have been working with all sorts of clients since then helping them to develop robust strategies and then to execute those strategies so it's not always all around gaming. Sometimes it's about strategy workshops and planning workshops, but a lot of it is around the gaming and what we're going to be talking about today, including clients that we now have like Mercedes and Shell. And I'm going to take you through a couple of those case studies as I, as I take you through some of the detail today. But the origin for why I thought that gaming was so important actually related to a situation I faced in Afghanistan at one point in my career. So in September 2008, uh, I was deployed into um, Afghanistan and into an area called Helmand, uh, which is in the southern area of, of, uh, of Afghanistan, not far from the Kandahar area, which is where the Canadian forces were. And we had a concept at that point in time of a safe space, if you like. So the center was this place called Lashkagar, and the, the military base was there, but also the political hub was there. The, the district governor, if you like, the provincial governor of Helmand District worked out of there as well. And the idea was that around the outside of Lashkagar, you had a whole series of bases, okay? And those bases acted as a barrier. And inside that barrier was the safe space. So the concept was that we, controlled by the military headquarters in the center, which is where I worked, would protect that safe space through the protective barriers and the bases around the outside. But on the fourth day of our tour, having got six and a half thousand people out and six and a half thousand new people in, i.e. the people that, that we would be working with and in charge of, it all went horribly, catastrophically wrong when the base that I was in, Lashkagar, remember sitting right in the very center of this safe space, this supposedly protected space, got attacked by 400 fighters, uh, Taliban fighters from three different directions simultaneously, supported by mortars and rockets that they put in on the far side of the Helmand River. And you know, when you have only 70 people inside this base, most of whom are headquarters staff like myself that have done all a lot of fighting, but we're in that headquarters because of our experience in doing that fighting and how now to apply our experience, we're not necessarily people that have spent the last year preparing to fight. So it's much like many businesses, really, at times that you know, as you get more experienced, you find yourselves in higher positions within the business and you become leaders within the business that get a little bit more distance from the day-to-day -day activity of what is going on. But all of a sudden, we found that that day-to-day -day activity was right on our doorstep. 
and we had 400 people attacking us with lots of shrapnel and rockets flying around all over the place. And there's only 72 of us versus their 400. Um, so you're in what the Royal Marines technically describe as a suboptimal situation, to say the least. Uh, and we had to work out what to do and how to get out of it. Now, we had done some gaming around what happens if our base gets attacked. We weren't expecting it because we were in the center of this safe space. And essentially what had happened was that over time, the opponents had infiltrated past the outer bases. And I'm going to come on to some of the, lesson, of the lessons we learned in a minute. But you know, we were sitting there essentially trying to work out what to do and how to go about it. So we worked out and had worked out in advance that if we were attacked and everybody was involved, the one thing that would really help us were the AH-47, the, the attack Apache helicopters, because they can sit far enough back from the fight that they can work out what's going on without being in threat, but they can also reach in and do something about what's going on and start to target things like the mortars and the rockets to make life a lot better for us. We got through the night, obviously, because I'm now sitting here, although I do still have a hearing aid from being a bit deaf, getting a bit close to too much high explosive. But when we got through that event, we were sitting there the next day and going, right, why did this happen? When we, 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 we did a game working about what would happen if we got attacked, but we weren't expecting to get attacked. So how did that come about? And a couple of the reasons are contained within this really fantastic HBR article that I definitely encourage people to have a read of. It essentially identifies five or six different ways in which strategies and plans tend to fail. The, one of the first ones they talk about is the escalation of commitment, which is hanging on to a strategy for a bit too long. So this is your classic blockbuster or Kodak, right? A strategy that was working, that now no longer seems to be working, but we're sure that if we just keep going, it'll be all right. And then another element within this article that I really like, they could talk about group ignorance. And group ignorance is different from groupthink, where we're all wildly in agreement with each other because we're incredibly excited about what's going on. Group ignorance is where there are people in that room who think, I know, something is going to go wrong with this plan and I know what it's going to be, but I don't feel I have the mandate or the right to stand up and say what it is. And so rather than express that and potentially embarrass myself or get myself in trouble, I'm just going to keep quiet. And so there are individuals within the group who know about a problem but aren't expressing it. And you know, there's, there's another great book called Bolt from the Blue, and in it, the author Pullen talks about you know, the unknown knowns, as he calls these. Things that, as leaders, we aren't always aware of, but people in our organizations are. So how can we pull those out? And, and both of those factors, essentially, were what tripped us up in Afghanistan, in Helmand, in 2008. Because the policy had been of this safe space and this ring of bases, right? But the issue was that over time, the metric for success, if you like, the strategy within Helmand was to expand and expand and expand where those bases are. Keep pushing them out because you want politically in London to be able to announce that you control more and more real estate within Helmand province. And look how well we are doing. And that became the measure of success. But with no more resources ever coming in, no more people coming in, what was a really good solid barrier when it was quite small and close to Lashkagar became a sieve when it's in a colander, if you like, when it became really far from Lashkagar and therefore people could just pass through it at will. So that was the escalation of commitment. We were carrying on with a strategy that wasn't making any sense. And the problem was that there were people in Afghanistan, in Helmand at that point in time, who knew it wasn't working, who were in these bases. And as each, if you like, rotation came through, each six months tour of duty came in, nobody was saying to the next tour of duty coming in, by the way, this is a nightmare, it's not working. 
So that group ignorance was maintained and essentially that's what tripped us up. And so I became through that and through that experience and through reading this HBR article, really passionate about gaming and going into gaming. And now war gaming and business war gaming has a certain title to it, if you like, and not everybody likes the name. And, and I don't necessarily like the name. I'm, I'm not sure that war gaming is altogether appropriate. And the, the reason behind that, and the reason why we tended more to just use just gaming or pressure testing, is because of the connotation of how these games started to come into the business sphere. You know, you've got a book down there, bottom left, from, by Benjamin Gillard, which was at the time it was published, recognized as being one of the leading books around business war gaming. And it's because his book was based on what the military used to do, right? So Benjamin Gilad was a member of the Israeli armed forces, and he talked about how war games could be used in the commercial sphere. And even as recently as April this year, McKinsey have brought out this article, this magazine around bias busters, war games, what are they used, useful for? And I'm sorry, but for me, both of these articles and, the, and books are flawed because all they talk about is competitive intelligence and competitor analysis. So a business war game, according to this article that McKinsey have and Benjamin Gillard's book, is entirely about me versus my opponent in my immediate market. Now, yes, it's important to understand market tendencies and trends and who is coming in and what are they trying to do. It is important to understand if I launch a new product or a new service or a new technique, what will my opponents do? What will my competitors do in that market space? But actually, that's probably only about 5% or 10% of the reason why your plan will possibly fall over. Far more likely are changes to policy, changes to the environment, COVID suddenly coming in from left field, trade agreements changing between different countries through negotiations. The fact that maybe your sales team is signing checks that your operations team can't cash. You know, a really common product problem when we launch a new product or a new strategy is the sales team gets so excited by it, they sell it through the door, out of the roof, knocking numbers all over the place. And there's, you know, you've got this huge demand now with customers ready for it, but your operation team can't deliver it. But because the only gaming that's been done is me versus my competitor, we've missed that crucial element of, well, actually there's lots of internal factors to this, internal to my own business, which will cause us to potentially fall over. So what I'm gonna do shortly is talk you through a couple of different techniques that you can use to do these games, but to get more of a 360 degree view of your plan or of your strategy. Before that though, I'd like to first of all focus on some principles. And once we've gone through the principles, I'll then take any questions that you, that you may have so far, okay? So the, some, some of the principles behind gaming first, before we get into the different techniques. First of all, have a really good think about a safe space and creating a psychologically safe space for a game to happen inside. It won't help you if you bring people into a room to take part in a game and they feel that either through hierarchy or the culture of the organization that they can't really put their hand up because all we've done is we've created that group ignorance, but just put it into a meeting room. So one of the things we really need to think about with gaming is how can I get people into that room to take part, to feel like they've got the right to put their hand up, to feel like they've got the right to make a challenge to the plan, regardless of who they are, regardless of what their background is or their position in the business. Because Everything is going to come from the different ideas in that room. So we need people to feel like they are welcome to, to contribute, no matter who they are. And that comes then to the, the third bullet point 
in here around diversity of thinking. I don't know if any of you have come across Matthew Said's other books, like Black Box Thinking is one that's relatively well known. But his most recent one, Rebel Ideas, is all about this diversity of thinking or cognitive diversity. Not necessarily demographic diversity, but diversity of thinking. Because there is, if you like, a possibility he puts forward in his book. And I think it's, you know, for some people, this is maybe quite a, quite a, a I suppose, a controversial point of view. That if six people have had a similar upbringing, gone to a similar school and college, a similar university, did a similar, similar degree, been recruited into a similar company via similar values, then actually it doesn't really matter that they have a different gender or belief. It's because they're all going to think the same because they've had the same process to get to that point. So what Matthew Said is arguing is that this diversity of thinking is hugely important when we're considering our games and our plans and our strategies. And so bringing people in who aren't all essentially just one person, as the bottom diagram is shown here, where we've got six or seven people in a room, but effectively they are all the same person, all thinking in the same way. This is what happens often if we have our senior leadership team considering every problem. If you start to bring in more of a vertical slice of your organization, people who are really at the forefront of delivery of your organizations, people who are doing that real client facing stuff, but also maybe people who aren't necessarily in your organization. So what about a client, a client that you trust enough or can bring in under some sort of you know, non-disclosure agreement or legal framework to listen to your plan? helping your you know to shape your plan better to your clients so rather than you, rather than it being this is what we think our clients want it's well we can actually hear what the client wants or a supplier the point is that whatever the problem space is as represented by that top block the more diverse opinions we can get into that the better the outcome is going to be of the game or the test and invariably then our success in delivery of it clearly though now it's becoming obvious that if we're going to create that safe space and we're going to get in a diverse bunch of people to the room to help take part, we've got to prepare properly. And hence that second bullet around preparation. We've got to make sure that people are walking through the door, feeling like it's a safe space, knowing what the topic is we're going to test, knowing what the behaviours are that we're looking for. Because if we come in ill prepared and they just walk into the room, we lose the first half an hour or even an hour of the game just trying to get people up to speed. So making sure that that thorough preparation is done in advance so we understand who's coming into the room so that the relationships have been built between the facilitators and the people that are going to be there is really important. And then it's also really important to, to, to stick to being output focused. When we go into the room, and I'll talk to you a little bit later about how we design, develop and prepare for a game. And I'll show you the process that I use myself with my own team to do it for our clients. You want to set out some outputs that you want. You know, when we go into this game, it's no, it's not, we're not just going into the game willy nilly and thinking well, what might happen. What we really want is some clear outputs from it. And so making sure that as you're running the game, you stay focused on those outputs and don't get distracted off down little alleyways that seem really interesting, but actually aren't contributing to that output that you've looked for. So if the outputs are around, how do we communicate this plan to our clients, to our shareholders, to our people internally within the business? that is what you stay focused on and you don't get drawn off down little other areas the other two principles that are, that are important around uh, print the, you know, the gaming side of things are first of all that it should be a transitory experience for for quite a few business leaders they find the concept of challenge quite difficult or people in their organization find it difficult to challenge them so even if we are vulnerable, open leaders who are saying to our teams, I want you 
to bring the critique. I know that you've got good ideas and I want you to bring them forward. If those individuals still feel uncomfortable, even if we've given them permission to do so, then sometimes it helps everybody to understand that this is a transitory moment in time and that we are not opening up a Pandora's box where everybody's expected to criticize everybody all the time because then we get nothing done. It's actually about going from business as usual and how we operate on a day-to-day -day basis, stepping temporarily into the game where the rules are slightly different and everybody's opinion is valued and everybody is expected to speak up and to give their opinion, which helps us to identify a whole bunch of actions and risks and things that we need to do. And then we step back to business as usual to make those actions and to deal with those risks. So it's a transitory in and out piece that starts to then help people feel a bit more comfortable about it. No doubt there'll be questions about how we do this for the first time and bring this sort of thing in, but I'm happy to, happy to look at those as you ask them. The last point then about a game is timeliness, about when you would do it. And I've got a case study to talk about in, in just a minute after I've taken any of your questions so far. Um, but being very careful to think about when you do a game, because if you leave it too late, and this is the tendency that a lot of the clients that I have worked with and have seen, they feel that they want to have the plan as robust as possible before they test it. They don't want to expose the plan before it's ready and people feel it's ready. And the problem with that is that by that point in time, everybody in the organization, particularly the project team, have invested so much emotional engagement with it they're so involved with it psychologically, emotionally, that when the game shows that it's got all sorts of holes and problems, it's really difficult to get them to shift to how do we change it? What do we do? How do we adapt it? Because they don't like that. Equally, if you do a game too early and there's no real even outline idea about what we might do, then people are in the room sitting there thinking, well, hang on a minute, we don't have a plan. And it's really obvious we don't have a plan. So thinking about the timing and the timeliness of a plan is also really important as a, as a principle of gaming. And um, Ruth, Anna, I'm very happy to stop and to, to pause for any questions that might have come in at, at, that, at that point in time before I move on to a case study. Thanks, Chris. And I think timeliness might be something that you could expand on because Jim has just put a question and he says, how do you manage key individuals who refuse to participate? And I'm putting air quotes around this, the game process. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point. And I suppose it comes down to culture, uh, Jim, you know, really uh, within the organization. We often find we, so we work with all sorts of different organizations, right? We work with digital and technology um, types, of, types of organizations, but we also work with, at the other end of the extreme, some really heavy industry, manufacturing, oil and gas, traditional long serve people. And anytime you mention the word game, you're quite right. You know, people roll their eyes and go, what is this new world nonsense that I'm getting involved in? Um, there's a couple of things that help me personally that I guess you could also use. The first is to actually say, well, look, this is what the military do. You know, this isn't, this isn't about gaming as in having fun and all sitting down and putting on different colored hats. You know, necessarily, this is actually about making sure that the plan is fit for purpose. And if the military do it, maybe it's a good idea that we should look at it. So that can sometimes help is to kind of debunk, if you like, this, this, this word around, around game and why sometimes we would call it a pressure test, or sometimes we'll call it a stress test, depending on the audience and on the culture of the, of the organization we're working with to bring people along. The other thing I think that's worth mentioning, Jim, is that often the people who are the most reluctant to take part are going to be your best participants, because they are already sitting there thinking, is this really going to work? Do I really like it? So they are your natural, if you like, critical thinkers who like to pose in problems. And 
I know that we all have within our organization, I know I certainly have had for quite a while, people who like to stick a, stick a spanner in the works and, and actually you know, cause a little bit of upset because they, you know, and it's because they think that actually it's worth expressing that. And so this methodology, if you like, can help bring those people to the table. And so sometimes it's about sitting down with them and saying, look, I know you don't necessarily like the idea of it being a game or a pressure test or a stress test. I know you don't particularly like the idea of being in a room with the other people that are going to be there. But actually, you are really important to this plan because you are going to help me with the reality check. So I think the more that you can make people feel valued in themselves and in the contribution they're likely to bring, potentially the better they are going to come into the room, even if it's still dragging their heels a little bit. I think that's a great point. And, and actually, it's a good segue to the question that I had, which really was about preparation. You've talked a lot about psychological safety, creating an environment where people feel like they can speak up to the hippo in the room, uh, you know, and the, and the vulnerability also of the leadership. What might be a couple of you know bullet points for the strategy for preparation with a team? So I think um, it's it's a lot of it is about sitting down and first of all meeting up with as many people as possible that are going to take part prior to the actual event. Um, a mistake that we made as a business early on was that we would just say to people, you're going to take part in a game uh, and basically turn up on this day at this time. And you could see that people were deeply uncomfortable then in the game itself. And we hadn't realized that because we come from a culture where it was just natural to challenge and to critique and to question because the military do that. Um, and so actually what we spend a lot of time doing now is making sure that we meet with people every single person that's going to take part now obviously for time efficiency it's better if you can do that as a small group but equally anybody that can't make that small group you should meet up with one-to-one -one as the facilitator to actually make that happen and to have that conversation because sometimes people are sharing in that conversation with the facilitator before the game misgivings doubts thoughts that they have and so you're building a rapport with them as the facilitator, which is which I think is really important. It also really helps the facilitator because if he comes across or she comes across then somebody who they feel is maybe a bit too extrovert, they can think, oh, OK, I've just got to be wary of that person on the day and help manage that. So it leads to a much better game. But the other re the other way in which you create the psychological safe space is, I'm afraid, often through having external facilitation. Because if you facilitate it internally yourselves, then anybody taking part in the game will feel like there is some sort of agenda here. And the facilitators themselves won't be able to help separate themselves from the day-to-day -day work that they do. And so they will probably have an idea about where they're taking the game because it's their own personal preference. So the other way to create the safe space is to have that independent objective third party facilitating it wherever they come from you know there's facilitators absolutely everywhere in, in every country that, that can do this sort of thing because that often aids with the safe space the thought that actually there's somebody else in the room so we're all going to play nicely it's a bit like you know i've got 20 year old and 18 year old kids and it's amazing how much better they react to any sort of input from my brother or my sister, as Uncle Andy and Auntie Sal, than they do from me. And it's because it's that all of a sudden one step removed person that's, that's involved. So safe space can often be created either through some diligent, careful preparation, meeting, helping people get an understanding of what they're going to do and why they're doing it, why it's important, but also having some sort of sense of objectivity and independence to the facilitation. I don't know if that helps answer the question, Ruth Ann. No, that's perfect. And I think you've talk, addressed mitigating bias in that aspect as well. All right, we've got a little bit of time and we want you to carry on here, Jim, or Chris, <laughs> if they can. No problem, no problem at all. So if I get in now then to a couple of case studies and some examples of games, 
Um, so the first one is is a game that we did for the for the co-op. Um, the supermarket retailer that, that you know as, as well as we have in the UK. Now, they were launching a membership scheme, and this is on the, the point on timeliness, okay? They were launching a new membership scheme, and the idea at the time essentially was to try and get people buying more of the co-op own brand label, because that would start to streamline essentially their supply chain and their procurement chain and make them more efficient. And so they, they came up with a plan of this five plus one scheme as a new membership scheme, uh, where if you bought a, an own brand label, you would get 5% off it. But also you would get 1% would go to a charity of your choice, which you as the consumer now had personal choice over and could direct. So you know, it, was this, it was this way of incentivizing people through some discounts, but also through doing something that's right and doing something that's right for a charity that you had choice over to help streamline things as they were going along. And so they worked on this plan for nearly six months, whole team putting it together. And then two weeks before they went to launch, they went into and, and decided they wanted to, to run a pressure test. And so we came in to run this pressure test for them. And as we were going through it, everything was quite tidy, quite tight, as you imagine, you know, six months of planning, it's looking really quite good. But I was sitting there and thinking, well, do you know what? I'm quite interested by this offer. I like the idea that I could get 5% off money, but I'm also giving money to a, waiter, to a charity. And I'm not an existing member right now. So I wonder how many other people would be as attracted by this as I am. And so we started to explore within the, within the pressure test and within the game, the risk of catastrophic success because their modeling had been entirely done around existing members just shifting across to the new membership. And when we started to look into, well, what would happen if you got a significant increase on membership? Because lots of people like this and want it. We are now two weeks away from launch. If you get a lot more people, how long is it going to take you to get more cards produced? more membership cards produced. Well, it'll take us three weeks to a month. Okay, and what are you advertising at the moment that the people will have cards back? What timeline do they get their card back and be able to start to use it in? We're saying it's going to be one week. Okay, well, straight away, we've got a problem here because if you get a lot more people signing up, then you're not going to get the cards to them in the time that you said you're going to get them to them. And now social media and Twitter is going to be alive with the failure of this launch. If that starts to happen, how many people have you got in your call center and your contact center to deal with problems? Just problems signing onto it or choosing a charity of their choice, never mind an increase in volume and demand that was unexpected. Well, we haven't got any increase in call center staff at all. But you're shifting your whole membership to a new way of working and they've got to go through a subscription process. So there's going to be problems with that. So why haven't we got more people coming into the call contact center to deal with that so that so you're dealing with your customers in a better way? And actually, that's exactly what happened, right? They had a huge volume, more than they were expected, sign up for this card. But at least because of the game, they'd identified it as a problem and had decided to do something about it in advance. The issue was that doing that change, making those changes was incredibly difficult because they'd waited until two weeks before launch to do it. So now psychologically, people didn't want to adapt the plan, but also they just didn't have the time to make it happen. And they were scrabbling around trying to find ways to actually find other card suppliers. So that was really interesting to do. We used a particular type of game or two particular types of game for them in that process. One was a pre-mortem and one was a red team versus blue team approach. And I'm going to talk through a little bit of both of those right now. The other test that we often do is the De Bono six thinking hats, but I think that people are probably more aware of that than some of the others. So I won't concentrate for time's sake on doing anything to do with De Bono and the six thinking hats. I'll do more on red team, blue team, and on the pre-mortem approach. 
So the red team, blue team approach essentially is one in which you have a blue team that is small. It's only about three to four people strong. And they are the champions of the plan. So they are presenting the plan and saying, this is what we are doing. This particular type of test is the one that we used to use in the military an awful lot because this simulates the most likely set of events that might happen in the future. You essentially start at day zero of your plan and you start to conceptually roll your plan out over time. By this point in time, we will be doing this. We will be here with these products or services. We'll be talking in this way with these campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you roll your plan out over time, championed by the blue team saying what is happening. They are faced by a panel of red team. And the red team should comprise everybody or a representative of every type of person who will be affected by that plan. So if you are doing a new product launch or something along those lines, a new service, then the red team will comprise either role played or for real your competitors. They will have your clients, your suppliers, maybe media, and you know industry media in the sector that you're involved in. If you're in a regulated industry because you're in the financial or legal sector, maybe you have the regulator role played or in the room for real. But you also have all of your internal functions that I mentioned earlier on, like your marketing, your sales, your finance, communication, whatever else you may have. And that panel essentially sits and listens to the plan and challenges it. Now, it doesn't have to be a negative challenge. It doesn't have to be that won't work. I don't believe that. It can be a positive challenge as well. It can be something saying, well, I think we're being too risk averse. We should take more risk in this and be more aggressive in our strategy. But the idea is that through the process of the blue team presenting and then the red team reacting to what they've heard, you start to get a much more granular understanding of where some of the issues are, where some of the gaps and the risks are, where some of the opportunities lie, what you now need to do so some actions. And the whole thing is run by the facilitation team or the control team guiding and moving it around so that we make sure that if a challenge comes back from the red team to the blue team, it's answered and something goes up on the board and we capture those outputs. So it's a really useful planning tool. It's a really great pressure testing tool because you've got that 360 degree view represented by the panel in front of you. And that red panel essentially is bespoke to the situation and to the plan you are testing. So we just spoke about a type of test for maybe a product launch or a service launch, but equally it could be that it's for internal transformation and change. And if that's the case, then a lot of your red team are going to be more internal players rather than external because they're the people who are going to be affected by it more than others. So you start to adapt your red team according to the type of plan that you're testing and the type of situation that you're facing. To, to give you another case study then as to how this was done, we supported Shell doing their decommissioning plans for the Brent oil field in the North Sea. Um, and they actually looked at a game, if you can't contrast with co-op, four years before the first platform was due to be decommissioned. And what they weren't looking for was a technical test of their plan. They weren't looking for, can we actually, in a, from an engineering perspective, decommission this oil rig? Because they know they can work that out. The outcome and the outputs they were looking for from the, from the game was actually more around perception and communication and how to land that communication better. They wanted to know how the different groups might react to different options that they had for the decommissioning around how much stays in place. Does it all go? Does it all stay? What about options in between? How do people react to that? What do they think? So they essentially, with a bit of support from us, designed a red team that had things like environmentalists, 
represented, role played. They had competitors role played, but they had some Scottish Fisheries Federation, you know, a local fisheries federation put into the area represented for real. They had people who owned shell petrol stations for real in the room. And so they were able to get along with the internal functions of legal and communication and media and things like that, all of those different aspects playing off one another. And they started to realize as they were rolling this out that you had competitors saying, we don't want you to do anything too expensive because that then sets a precedent which we have to follow. You've got the environmentalists saying completely the opposite. And then you had the public representing something in between the two, but they could see how it would all play out. And as the competitor was talking, you saw the environmentalists react. And so things were there that they were, you know, they were starting to unearth that became really interesting for them and really rich in terms of detail. And it, they hadn't done the gaming approach before. And Shell is obviously very famous for having created, you know, the scenario planning technique, but they'd not done the gaming technique before. And when we presented them with the outcomes from the game, there was a degree of nervousness because it had only been done in a day, essentially, with a bit of preparation. The, the game itself had only taken a, one day. And so they went away and they started to look into it and, and they essentially did their normal process that they would normally do to do this analysis. And when they came back to us afterwards, they were saying to us, the project manager that used to do this was, well, it actually took us three months to come up with the same answers as we came up with in the one day and it cost us a lot more money. So Shell then started to use this gaming technique internally using their own facilitators an awful lot more and taking it forward. So I'm conscious that I've just gone through you know, a particular type of test. And before I move on to the next test, you know, it might be an opportunity if you do have any questions at this stage to, for, me to, for me to respond to those. Ruthann, I don't know if we have any at all. We don't, but I just want to uh, get a clarification. Like these are big companies. And for a smaller company, does that model still work? And, and what does it look like? Absolutely. It can still work for really small companies. Um, a lot of um, companies, and obviously we have the equivalent of, you know, of Tech Canada in, in over here of Vistage. You know, and there's lots of Vistage companies that sit in that sort of £2 million turnover bracket up to £10 million pounds, um, and you know, who don't have a huge number of staff. You can still absolutely do this red team, blue team approach because you can use it just for a small project. Probably one of the most contentious projects I saw done was about closing down the work canteen in, in, a, in a manufacturing unit, you know, and that was just done as a project approach of, right, well, who's on the red team? Who's on the blue team? Here's the blue team championing how we're going to close down, the, you know, the canteen, how it's going to be replaced with this drive up sandwich van option. And the red team were people that were around, well, how much is it going to cost to, to decommission it? taking it out, what about the impact on morale and welfare? You know, so, so absolutely it can be used at lots of different levels by lots of different companies. They don't have to be really big companies with big scale problems at all. Excellent, and one other question that's just come in. How does red team, blue team, how does that approach compare to fo the use of focus groups? So I think the difference, um, certainly if I, if I bring it back to what Shell found, was that um, using focus groups, uh, they tended to get a snapshot of what that particular focus group thought. Um, and you don't necessarily get the interaction between the different stakeholders playing out. So the benefit, if you like, of doing it, it's, it's, like, it's like a focus group, let's face it. The red team, blue team approach, you know, your, your question is quite right, is, is like a stakeholder um, or a focus group, but it's just managed in a slightly different way. Because as one individual is saying, well, I'm sitting here with this role, this hat I have on, and I'm essentially coming back to you with my critique, that is sparking ideas in the other people that are playing on that game and they then start to react. So it's a way of simulating the entirety of the ecosystem. And my experience of focus groups is they tend to be quite small because of the word focus. So actually you're getting a like a mini red team, blue team, but not the full 
red team experience because you're only maybe looking at a particular area and as soon as some of those people don't hear the feedback of other people from elsewhere it doesn't trigger the same sort of thoughts so yes i guess a focus group is kind of like a slimmed down smaller version um, so it could still be used in that way and I think you've brought up a good point. It is actually some of the unplanned. It's the interaction. It's the it's the it's the comment or the the expression that somebody makes. Like you said, the environment environmentalists making the oh uh, you know disparaged face of we don't want to spend so much money. You know, again, yeah. that's that's really critical, and that's something you might not have ever been able to look at before. Um, we're we're kind of getting close to time, but Jim's got a question here too. He says, have you tried flipping sure. red team, blue team members for additional input? So you switch them out halfway through. Absolutely, um, Jim. And, Jim, and this is particularly useful if you have a couple of different options within the plan. So it may be you, you've worked out that your plan could be delivered by either going down route A or route B. Um, if you present this game, a red team, blue team game, as what do you think of A and B, you just end up with this really horrible, general, generic discussion. But if you say, let's pretend we are absolutely doing route A, and you get a blue team to champion route A, and you go down that and you test that to see how route A stands up, then you maybe take a different blue team, and you change out some of the blue team and put them onto the red team, so quite right, and you then game route B, we're now doing route B, you get a really good comparative and it also allows people a bit like the De Bonos hats to think about the problem from different angles and different perspectives. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Perfect, all right, we're, we're gonna let you roll this home. <laughs> okay, um, so the next technique that could be quite useful, unfortunately it's quite simple to explain, is this pre-mortem technique that some people may have come across before. It's, it's generally credited to, to Gary Klein, who's obviously been a, a thinker in North America for quite some time on this. Um, but essentially, it's about presupposing failure. So this is an entirely different approach to the red team, blue team. The red team, blue team, you start at day zero and conceptually run your plan out against the ecosystem that's represented by the red team, which represents all of the people who'd be affected by it. This one can be done with a lot less players. It can be done just internally if you really want to. You don't have to have any external involvement at all. And essentially what you say is, if my plan, my strategy for my business was to achieve a revenue growth of X by two years time, let's now imagine that we are two years hence. We are at that point in time. And actually we have had an utter disaster. Not only have we not had growth, we've actually dropped down and we've had losses and we're now really struggling. And you imagine this fiasco and you say to people, why would that have happened? And you get the people in the room to identify all the reasons they can think of as to why that catastrophe would have happened. And having collated all of those reasons for the fiasco or the catastrophe, you then start to put them into what you feel is a risk order. What are the reasons for failure that are the highest risk, the biggest impacts, the most likely to happen? And then you start to work out how you would mitigate against those. So this is a way almost of doing worst case scenario planning, where you go to the end and then you work your way back so that you avoid the problem in the first place. Really effective, really powerful, really easy to do at any scale of business, small or large, big project, small project. There's a couple of health warnings that come with it. The first is that when you are getting people to generate the reasons for failure, make them write them down silently, first of all, in the room. Because as soon as somebody starts to speak and say, I think one reason for failure is this, everybody starts thinking along those lines and if you haven't taken the time to write them down first you don't get that diversity of thinking because we become influenced by what other people say the second tip i would offer is that if you're not careful this can be quite damaging to relationships inside your organization because the tendency is if i've been asked why would the plan fail and why have we had this catastrophe it's very easy for me to blame somebody else to blame another department 
and that then causes friction. So actually think quite carefully about the first maybe two times you go around the table with people reading out what they put on their pads, they have to read out something that critiques themselves or their area first, not somebody else's area, because that then tends to help diffuse that potential problem. I'm sure quite a few of you, and I know Ruthann asked me this, and I'll finish at this point um, with how we actually go about this end to end. What do I actually do to, to develop a game and, how, and what are the steps that we go through? So I put on the screen the steps that we go through using our own process for our own clients. And I'd be very happy to work on this with people if they want to have a look at it um, with a bit more depth, because behind each of these colored tiles, is a whole more level of, of granular detail around videos and checklists and tips and techniques or redacted reports, example templates. But essentially, you start out with the scope. Before you even think about the game, think about what you want to achieve from the game. Is it that you want to just basically get a whole bunch of people bought into the plan? You know what the plan is. And therefore, the critique of the plan is great, but actually what you really need is for them to buy into it and feel like they own it and they want it to succeed. So that becomes an outcome that you are looking for, defined by the scope. It might be that actually everybody already believes in the plan and what we've got to do, and we're worried about the technical aspects of the plan delivering properly. So we're looking for the gaps. Those are two very different outcomes, okay? So defining the outcome, from the outset is really important because that then allows you to choose the type of game you're going to use. Because you might think, well, actually, this one is more suitable to a pre-mortem. This one is more suitable to a red team, blue team approach. This one is more suitable to a De Bono six thinking hat approach. So you're choosing the game appropriate to the outcome that you're looking for. The next step builds on that, which is the design where you work out who are the stakeholders will be affected by this because if you understand the outcomes that you want and the game you're going to use that starts to define who should come into the room to take part you also need an agenda to be set out and thought about so that you make sure you cover all of the topics you want to cover because the risk is otherwise you do so much on the first topic that you neglect all of the others We've spoken about the preparation already in quite some depth, which is the next stage. But just to go over it a little bit more again, making sure that people get a pre-briefing, maybe even you do a little mini game in advance, making sure that they know they're coming into a room to test a specific topic, what that topic is, what their role is, understanding the behaviors that are desired in the room at the time. All of that is really important as part of the preparation phase before you then shift onto the game itself. And the most important thing of the game is A, the facilitation, as we've already mentioned, but B, capturing those outputs. The three things that we generally get out of any game are actions, things that I now need to go away and do to improve the success of my plan, risks that I hadn't previously identified and opportunities that I hadn't previously identified. And if you've got those three, you're already quite a long way down the route of basically the next stage, which is the report writing and putting that into a report so that you end up with people understanding exactly what they're doing and how, because it's down on paper and it's come out from the game. I'm conscious of, of time and you know, people are still stuck with us. So I'm quite impressed with your dedication, uh, dear listeners. Um, but are there any other questions at that, point in, at that point in time before we close up and I hand it back across to Ruth Ann? I'm going to encourage, I see a, a, a member on here, Tony, and Tony, you know who you are, uh, and I know that you've done quite a bit of environmental work. Would this work, would this model work, or, or part of these gaming uh, systems work for some of the work that you do? I'm just going to let Tony weigh in if he's going to be there. Okay. But other than that, um, while we're waiting for a couple of things, I think it's really great that, you know, like you've identified, you know, that you're going to pull out action, you're going to pull out risk, and you're going to pull out a report, but the report's the communication. It's, it's really, how do we, how do we put this into a way in that everyone can now see what they did, their input and, and the buy-in for that. I think that was a really, 
a good clarity. Absolutely, and I think you know the, the, the benefit of the, the benefit of doing a game is it, you know, and hopefully this has come across, is that it's not just about the report that you get at the end of it. It's not just about the technical test of the plan. It's about collaboratively and collectively sitting in a room together and sharing doubts, sharing misgivings, sharing confidence. You know, having the thing, oh, this is better than I thought it was. Actually, we're, we're in a better place than I thought we were. But everybody essentially ends up with that matrix chip download because we've all been in the same room together at the same time. And, and often it's a way of different departments getting to know one another better simply because they've heard what the other departments do. Yeah, that's excellent. And I think, like you say, uh, mitigating some bias. Uh, by speaking about my own department first uh, and, yeah. and creates this, you know, again, going back to that psychological safety, people aren't there to attack one another. We're here for a common outcome and, and identifying what that outcome is going to be ahead of time. Absolutely. What we yeah. Well, we are out of time, Chris, and I want to thank you for being with us. Um, and we won't want, don't want to hold you back from your evening pint. So we are going to <laughs> log off here. I want to remind everybody that this has been recorded and I'm going to also get uh, Chris to send us these slides as well. So if you want to kind of go through some of the gaming um, choices and also if you want to connect with Chris, I believe that his his email information is there, his company with Quirk Solutions, but you can also contact me and uh, reach out to Chris via me. So thank you again to everyone and to, especially to you, Chris. Take care. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a real pleasure. I'm very happy to help anybody with any follow-on requests they may have. People are logging in that they really enjoyed it. So thanks again. Great, good. Okay, take care, folks.